Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for waking up us up this morning. We thank you for breathing. We thank you for your presence, Lord. Continue to keep us, guide us, comfort us. In the midst of all of this trouble that America is experiencing, help us to understand that you're present, Lord, that you're here with us, Lord. If anybody today doesn't feel your presence, Lord, just, just rest upon them. Put your hand on their shoulder, Lord, and help them to understand that you're here with them to, to keep them, Lord. Keep them under your wing. Open our minds and our hearts today for whatever you have for us today, Lord. Bless us, bless our families in this community. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
that true this morning? Blessing him in everything, the good and the bad, sun, rain, COVID, non-COVID, work, no work, money, no money. Just stay focused on him through all of it. There's still fear. There's still concern. There's still, oh no, what's it going to shut it down? But let's keep praying. And 
And we're going to see how God will continue to work in these areas and over the lives and that and have his way. Continue to pray for our country, our nation. It's quite a time that we live in, a time when there's much uncertainty, anxiety, and we need the presence of God, don't we? We need it in our lives, we need it in our country, we need it in our marriages, we need it in our church, we need it to be everywhere. So would you bow your heads as we pray this morning, and there are many other needs, but I want you to lift in your heart right now, would you? I stand in awe of you, Holy Father, Holy God, because of all that you've done. Lord, we thank you this morning that we are assembled together in your presence. Lord, there are people that are watching right now that are not present, but they are. Lord, that those that will tune in later, but they will make the right connection in that divine appointment with you. But Lord, as we focus to you in this moment, in this time, we say thank you. We say praise your name. We echo the words of Gino in saying thank you for breath, thank you for life, thank you for mercy, and thank you for such a great salvation for which you purchased for us. And Lord, we love you. We're so glad, thankful that, Lord, you have allowed us to gather in your name. And, Lord, we ask that as we look to you, may our, our thoughts and may our concerns and may our fears and may our anxieties, may they fade away. Because you are high and lifted up. For your, your glory, let it fill every aspect of our lives. Lord, may we surrender things this morning. But we're not asking you to take things. We're giving things to you. Lord, it's the greatest curbside sale in our life today. It's all yours. Come and get it. It's yours. It's free. Take it, Lord. Take it. That we might exchange it for your glory. That we might exchange it for your love. Lord, that we might exchange it for being the forgiven people that we are. May we walk in that, Lord. Now, Lord, as we continue, as we gather at the table in just a bit, as we reflect on what you've done for us, we are a joyous people in spite of our circumstances, because you have accomplished all things. And all things are under your feet, Lord. And then that day comes that we will be consummated. We will see it when you, whether you split the eastern sky and we're like, there you are. Or we go to meet you in the air, Lord. You are king. And we give you praise in all your name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Continue in this song.
great crowds. What a great, he's now in heaven, but what a great song as, as we celebrate. Bless the Lord. Can you say you're blessed this morning? Amen. I hear mm, 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 mm. Say amen. amen. There you go. That's it. The Lord is worthy of blessing and praise. We have some announcements this morning I'd like to make, and then I hope you'll make note of these. And uh, one of the first announcements is this coming Saturday, we are having our Children's Bible Olympics. So it will be this Saturday. That's the 26th. And uh, it will be at 3 o'clock here. We'll have uh, its distance. And so those of you that are here this morning, I encourage you to be here a little bit early if you'd like. Um, thank you. You responded heartily to the help that we needed. And I think we have all that we need adult-wise and teens. So for our teens, they are going to be having some magic. Phil and Anitra, Melissa and Alan, they actually were here on Thursday night. They had a movie night based in here and uh, as a group. I'm hearing again, there's going to be some catapults and things. I'm a little nervous about that. But, you know, as long as they stay in the back of the parking lot, out into the woods, I think we'll be all right. But So if you won't, maybe stop by. But we do need to know that you're coming. So um, this morning, Mary has been going around with a clipboard. Uh, make sure I get my Marys. Mary Hambly with a clipboard. She's the black masked one, in case anyone didn't see. Um, to, to say, how many are coming? Just to get a head count that we do. Shelly, I think, has an announcement, right? Or I was just saying, also adult ministry, they can bring them meal, it's about meal. Yes, about bringing your, um, if, or if you would like to have a sandwich or the food that you need to bring, we're not going to have, we, as you know, can have buffet lines and stuff like that. We're not doing that. Um, so we'll have some bottled waters that you could get and those things like that. But if, for snacks and things that you'd like, please, you do need to bring those. Bring your lawn chair. There's going to be, I understand, a few uh, a little Olympic games for the adults, too, because the adult ministries is involved in that. Something with juggling and Shelly, I don't know what that is. <laughs> It's impressive after back surgery. She's juggling already in a unicycle. I, I, I want to see this on Saturday. You need to come, if anything, to see that. But so that's this Saturday. And then, as you uh, are aware, too, our teens have been meeting. If you have not connected, those of you that are watching, um, Phil and Nitra, Melissa and Alan doing a great job and uh, connecting. Thursday nights they have been meeting, and I can reach out to them to know specifically on times as well. Planning ahead for the future in October, I know that's not that far away, but on October 18th, we are going to have the return of our some Sunday school, and so I want you to be thinking and planning, and you'll hear more, there'll be more detail about our adult classes and the children and that, so be planning, be thinking, be praying, and as always, we look to the opportunity to gather together and we are creating the space and the necessary things that we can do that together. So, again, keep that in mind. We have one other announcement that we'd like to share this morning, which is upcoming. Some of you, if you're observant, you may have noticed it. But I'll let uh, our missions director talk to you more. So, so this uh, month, uh, so the Church of Nazarene, I know we've all been kind of, at least myself, has been kind of lost in our community, in our state. We can't leave. We can't come. We have to do special things to do that. But the remember, the Church of Nazarene is a global church, and it's still reaching the world, even though we can't get out there at this point in time. There are Nazarenes from all over the world reaching. Twice a year, we, do, we take an offering called Alabaster Offering. And it's an offering that goes to exclusively to building churches, schools, hospitals, specifically in areas of the country, sometimes in the United States as well, that um, do not have the funds or do not have the means or the congregation to support them yet. And so we come behind them and help to build their buildings that they need to meet and have services in. So this month, is Alabaster is uh, Alabaster month. Um, it's going to be a little different in collecting Alabaster offering because like um, COVID has kind of changed things a little bit. So what we're going to do, we're announcing it today. Next Sunday, if you want to bring your Alabaster offering to the service, you're welcome to do that. We'll have the church open. There's no exchanging, so you just dump your money in and walk away. Um, if you cannot come to worship and be a part in-house, send it with somebody. Or you're welcome to call the church office. It's usually open between 8.30 to noon. 
uh, Tuesday through Friday, give, give Linda a call and say, can I stop by and put my offering in the church? You're welcome to do that throughout the week as well. Not on Saturdays, she's not here on Saturdays. So um, let, I want to play a little video off of our church website that talks about alabaster. Paraguay Church of the Nazarene, an alabaster church that was built in her community. A friend who knew her desperate situation invited her to a place of hope, forgiveness, and life. I know that every coin or bill that is placed in this jar is done so with sacrifice, but in doing so, in another place, another church, someone will come to know the love of God. I give thanks to God for those who have given sacrificially to the alabaster offering. And thanks to those offerings, today in Paraguay, we have this church, which has been such a blessing to the community and to those who have sought to know Christ. that the Lord has been faithful. He has taken care of my family and my life. So I want to thank the Lord for this church because through the Church of the Nazarene, I discovered the ministry where I can serve and especially Nazarene Missions International where I have been blessed to serve as local and district and in my president. I have the support of the congregation and the pastors as well, so I serve with great joy in this ministry. Every Sunday, the building is filled with people who come to find hope, forgiveness, and life. Just like the Lord gave it all, what are we willing to give so that the gospel may continue being preached and we may continue sharing the good news of salvation? The alabaster offering is very important because it helps to build seminaries, churches, and schools where the word has been preached and many souls come to surrender their lives to the Lord. Alabaster is something we can all participate in with gratitude and love. It is a blessing to serve the Lord in the Church of the Nazarene and also for the opportunity of being part of a team that works to expand the Kingdom of Heaven. Amen. So you are part of a bigger church, 143 different countries in the world. Church of Nazarene is in. That's a lot. And on next Sunday, in all of those countries, in all of the churches of Nazarene, they'll be having Alabaster Sunday. Think of that for a minute. You think, so in Paraguay, they are having Alabaster, and guess what? Their offerings are going to Uganda. Their offerings are going to Latvia. Their offerings are going to Eastern Europe. Because we believe that when we give to God and we return to those that what He has blessed us with, the word of the gospel goes out to all. So if I know you've seen as I have during this time of COVID, we have a coin shortage. That's because they're all in our alabaster boxes, right? <laughs> right. So we're probably going to like, great, that they're going to love it. Because when we give alabaster, the coin shortage goes away. Now, but you know, we take the paper money too. So if you don't have coins and it's a little short, if you'd like to bring your offering by, I'd encourage you to do that. Be a part of something greater. Think of it from Emmanuel Wareham to around the world. Amen? Amen? Well, together we have been journeying in our faith and we've been trying to sort out and say, how has our faith been? I, I see you came back, which is good. I know that the last week was kind of a tough service. It was kind of a tough lesson. And tough truths, sometimes we say they're tough, we'd like to avoid them, but I hope and pray that as you have been journeying with and through the book of Peter, and that you've allowed God to speak to you as you've been in the Word, 
If you haven't been in the Word, get back in the Word. Start today. You can. And we want to talk about this morning and how we want to keep journey, keep moving forward so that our faith will be a faith that will stand in the midst of these uncertain times, these, these, these kind of areas and uncertainty, but we want to have a faith that we look to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And that if maybe in this process our faith isn't where it should be on the rock of Jesus Christ, then we need to make a realignment. We need to readjust. We need to move and respond as the Lord speaks and as the Lord guides us. And Peter's been challenging us uh, and through the last couple of Sundays about one of the key ways that we as believers can really show our faith and show that we're where we need to be in the Lord is that we are able to be people that can submit to the authority of God. Submit to each other mutually out of love and respect because Christ has done that for us. He's been our example. Now, I don't know about you, but it's, it's hard. Isn't it hard? Can I get amen to submit? Oh. Because there's within us that says, no, I don't want to. But we realize the greatest joy that we have is that when we are willingly to lay down our rights and, and let Christ, I didn't say be a doormat, and I didn't say be a walkover, a pushover, that's not what we're talking about, but let Christ reign through us. We see the power and we know the closeness of our walk and journey with the Lord, and it makes a big impact to how Christ impact the culture and the world around us. So today, Peter's going to challenge us to something that, oh, equally, it can be difficult, and that's to suffer well. Oh, Pastor, do these sermons get any better? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it is, it can be difficult, can it? We open the Word of God, and we go to our favorite passage, and, oh, this makes me feel so good, and I need to pick me up from the Word today, and we do. But, you know, if, until we see the full counsel and we really embrace, because do we agree that we all live life in the day-to-day? -day? And it can be a slog at times. And it can be, ah, uh, where are you, God? I sense you, but I don't sense you. I need you, but I can't find you. You're there, but now you're not there. And we all live in that area. And so when we come to this, the Scripture speaks to us this morning about suffering well. And being able, because you see, as Peter's writing to the church, you and me, the reality of the day and age that we live in, although we live in, yes, America, the day and age of the church, and we're seeing and we're hearing it, that the suffering for your faith, I want to be very clear, is getting, and we're seeing it go up and up and up and up. We have nothing to hold, and I do in no way want to discredit or say that by any means we're suffering beyond. There are people around the world today that are suffering truly for their faith. Truly, moment by moment. We are blessed that we are allowed to gather, and I want to make sure that you hear that, you know that. But you see, the reality is we have a different kind of persecution that goes on in our country. Oh, it may not be physical, it may not be put you in jail, it may not be those, but there is a, a, a move, as you know, within the culture to be quiet, don't say that, don't speak up, and if you do, you are the problem. And it comes out in many ways, and all of us as believers, as we want to honor Christ, and we want to show the, the world that Christ has made a difference, and Peter is writing to the church to tell them, you can make a difference, and Christ will. But when that persecution comes, when you suffer for your faith, there is a way that we should respond. There is a way. And it's a way that is very powerful. And there is a way that has great influence. And he wants to share that with us this morning. So we should be a prepared people. And that's why we come. And so I think it would be easy to say, if you're a Christian, you're going to suffer. Let's just mark that down. That's not, that's not saying something new. In fact, Christ himself said, you will. Count it all joy. Remember James, when you face trials of many tribulations and all problems, just say, thank you, I've been counted worthy to suffer with Christ. So it shouldn't surprise us. It should not be, why is this happening to me? But instead, we ought to realize that through the process, through coming to us, that we can suffer in a good way when our faith, when our faith is challenged. So go to 1 Peter in chapter 3, and Peter hasn't quite finished yet in talking about what it looks like, but 
He wants to begin by showing us that when we suffer for doing good, have you ever suffered for doing good? Have you done the right thing and you paid the price? Have you said, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to tell the truth and you got in trouble for it? And if you said, that's not right, and you bore the brunt of, you, how come you make us look bad? Have you ever stood up for something and then paid the price for it? I can tell you, so oftentimes, if we're not careful, we realize how quickly it is and how sometimes easy it is to compromise on the truth and those things. And so he's going to challenge us about these things, and not only individually, but as a church and as God's people and what that means for us. So if you are there, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, he makes these words, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers and sisters, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil, or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all. Amen. And the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Father, may you help us to understand the beauty of being counted worthy of suffering in our faith and how we might do it victoriously to give favor and honor to you in your name. Amen. Amen. So Peter starts here by saying, I know I've told you in submitting, that's one of the first things that we've talked about in relationships, in authority, and to each other mutually, because it gives the picture to the world, to each other, that I am submitted to Christ. And as I'm submitted to Christ, I'm submitted to you. Because it's Christ in me that reaches out to you. And he closes it, and really in the first part of our text as we read it, he now makes the broader reach to the community, saying, hey, as God's people, you're to submit to one another. And there's some certain characteristics. We call this the characteristics that what we should be and what the, the world around us should see when they look at Emmanuel, Church of Nazareth, when they look at God's people. And we see this in the first few verses here, if you look. It's, it's about the fact that we're in this all together. Have you not heard that phrase recently on the news? We are in this together. We're all in this pandemic. We're all going through this together. We're all having to deal with feelings of, I'm uncomfortable, I'm anxious, I, I, I don't know what, I'm, I'm gonna do my part, you do your part, and we're gonna stay safe, and we're gonna work together. We're all in this together. And Peter, in the same breath, is saying this about our faith. We are all in the body of Christ, and when we suffer, one suffers, we all suffer. When one is lifted up, we're all lifted up. And so what he's saying is here, that if we are going to address that when we're persecuted in our faith and we have to suffer, really that shouldn't come from within the church. That shouldn't be happening in the church, God help us. But that we need to be looking at what we are made up of. See, if we expect to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in the world, that works through us, then we must be able to love each other first, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we be able to manifest those things first? And so the qualities he, he focuses here, look at verse 8. The first is harmony. Live in harmony with each other. This is the unity of the Spirit. Be of one mind. Not that we all agree, 
Not that we all are thinking the same things. And I want you to understand, unity is not uniformity, okay? It's not the same thing. Unity means cooperation amid diversity. I love that. Uniformity is not what the goal is. Unity does not mean uniformity. It means cooperation amid diversity. Because we don't all think the same way. We don't all do the same. We don't all have the same likes. But because we name the name of Christ, we all would look to Christ. We all, as we look to Him, it pulls us together. And that we care for one another. And that it's this goal that we have in harmony. He says here too that we should be sympathetic. For the second thing, look at it. Having compassion for one another. We should carry each other's burdens. You see, when, when we're facing persecution and suffering, the last thing we need is to have our brothers and sisters treating us negatively. Not being there to support us. Saying, I hear that you're going through a tough time at work. They're really persecuting. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. How can I lift you up? How can I come there beside you? It's being sympathetic to the opposite. It's, in fact, Sympathetic to that person and lifting them is the opposite of being selfish and self-centered. And so God's people should have these characteristics of living in harmony together, being sympathetic, having love for one another. And of course that term there, the word love uses that brotherly love. You get the word Philadelphia, Gino doing studies over here on love, right? Filio, where we get the word brotherly love. That we should love one another and that there should be compassion a tender heart, feeling for, deep feeling, compassion for each other. Do we have that? Is that what we mark as the church? When the world looks in, do they see that? And are they, are they realizing that? Humility. It's amazing that so many times in churches all over that pettiness and pride is really what keeps humility from being allowed. But instead, allowing keeping us humble before the Lord, keeping us humble before each other, it allows us then to be able to serve the Lord and show the world that Christ has made a difference in our lives. You see, Peter is saying here, this is what should characterize God's people. And as it does, the world sees how they love each other, as Jesus said, and they will know that they are my followers. That's a huge impact. And I've seen that in our midst in Eddie Manuel. I've seen how you have loved others. I've seen, I've heard the reports of how, wow, you guys are different. And not in a weird way, but in a way that says God is doing something there. I sense the love of God among you. And so he challenges that this is who we are and what we're called to be. And as we are called to this, he says there's a couple of things here you should notice that when we do this, we are blessed and we will inherit a blessing. And in verse 10, Peter now takes Psalms and he goes to the Psalms and he grabs Psalms 34 and he begins to lay out a few things here about what that looks like. And in Psalm 34, he shows us some of these qualities and he says to us that if we are going to be the people of God then, and we're going to stand up under persecution and suffering, then our participation is required. If you're going to suffer well, participation is required. Think about that for a second. See, in verse 10, he says this, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who are evil. You see, the, the participation that's required for God's people is this, that you see in verse 11, we're called to turn from evil. We're called to turn from wicked ways. We're called to turn from unrighteousness and instead to seek the Lord. When we seek the Lord in the things of God and His righteousness and we pursue it, we then can know the power of our salvation. We can know the presence of God. In fact, it will keep us from being distracted by the, all the things that are going on around us. Think of it, when you're being persecuted, when you are being challenged in your faith, we tend to get sucked into that. We tend to go, did you hear what they said? Did you see what they're doing? Did you know what they said? Did you see what they posted? Did you hear what they said? Oh, we get pulled into that instead of staying focused on God. Instead of focused on what Christ 
and pursuing that and allowing those things to, to go where they need to be and not be a part of us. See, I like in verse 11, it says, we need to be a peacemaker. I can't help but think that Matthew remembered in both of these, don't return insult for insult. Don't repay evil for evil, it said. I think Matthew, who had a front seat on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6 and 7, I'm sure that Peter said, yeah, I think I remember my Lord saying, when they strike you on the right cheek, turn your other cheek. If they ask for your cloak, give them all of the rest of your clothes. And don't repay evil for evil. Instead, be a peacemaker. And if I remember correctly, on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what? Children of God. You see, so there's participation in this as well, that we are called to participate in allowing Christ to have His way in our life. So that when we are persecuted, so that when we are forced to defend our faith, to stand up, we realize that we have a cause that we're not to be a part of, but we're to follow Him. And in verse 13, he says, don't be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid. Expect it. Peter himself certainly knew it. He certainly knew what it meant to suffer. He remembers that there was to be no compromise. He was more concerned about what God thought than what men thought. He said that. We must be more concerned about what Christ thinks than what men think. Then we will share the gospel. And he encourages the Christians that they should... Focus on Christ. Stay focused in suffering. Stay focused when your faith is being challenged on Him so that you would know the power of it. And then we come to verse 15. And this is the part where I want to give you some really practical things as we walk through this scripture. Because this is something that I wrestled with for a long time. I still wrestle with it. I imagine many of you do. It's a verse that is often quoted but in verse 15 you say, But in your heart set apart Christ, sanctify yourselves to Christ. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So the question is, what do you say? How do you respond when your faith is challenged? And Peter is writing to the scattered church to tell them this is how you respond. I tell you, growing up, I remember being a teen in the youth group, and teen pressure, and teen, uh, you know, peers and friends, and activities and things that we may not or should not be doing or participating in, and being trying to take a stand as a teenager and serve God, and it's hard. So teenagers, I know it's hard. And we were teenagers once. I know you find that hard to believe. But we struggled with it, serving God and staying faithful in our commitment to follow Jesus Christ, and... I can remember being challenged or tempted to participate and I'd offer the, I'd offer the excuse, well, that's, uh, that's against my religion. Anybody heard that one? I don't do this because that's against my religion. Well, and it may be true, but I realized that, you know what, after a while as an adult, that didn't quite cut it. Against, really, why do you do it? Why do you believe that? Why do you follow? Why do you give your money to the church? Why do, you, why do you serve God? Why do, why do you pray? It doesn't do any good. Why do you read the Bible? That's just a bunch of things that, are, that men wrote. That weak people believe. Well, um, and I began to be really challenged by that. I don't know if you have. I'm challenged by co-workers for that. And so I was saying, well, I should have a response. And when they begin to ridicule or make fun of, and that's our culture today, maybe at school, maybe at work, Maybe you're left out, excluded, because of your faith. I think we realize that it's a spiritual thing to begin with anyways, that where light is, darkness cannot be. And that if you're following and serving Christ, there's going to be an animosity, because the world doesn't understand, can't understand, the God you serve. And so that's the first thing. But the second thing is that Peter says, yes, that's true, but when you suffer, and when you're challenged in your faith, there is a way to respond that honors Christ and that gives an opportunity to share. And the first thing he says that we should do in verse 15 is we should focus on Christ rather than our fears. I can't tell you one time, if I will, uh, I was working and working in 
taking care of a patient in one of the other uh, occupations and work. And there was a provider, one of my colleagues, who also was taking care of the same patient. And he began, he knew I was a follower of Christ, and he was very Jewish. And he would ridicule me. He would say to me, he would, it, he would tie to entice, he would provoke, he would make every effort to say things to me, to get me to respond, pay evil with evil, insult with insult. And it got to the point he would involve staff members to actually bring, in, bring them against me as well as a believer and other people. And I had a choice to respond. I could say, well, I'll just ignore it, go away. Well, I could get in his face, tell him. Well, is there another way? Yeah, focus on Christ. And so I began to pray and say, Lord, I don't know how to respond in this situation. My faith is being challenged. I know what I'd like to tell him. But you know what, Lord, I want to honor you with this. And the Lord began to say, you need to begin to pray. And as you do, let you and me, you know, the Lord, Show myself strong through this. Let me handle this for you. So begin to just respond in gentleness to him. I'm sorry you feel that way. Thank you. I, I, well, I'm sorry. That's who I'm, what I believe. And God is the difference. And so we actually got into a discussion over a certain patient. Because I had been ministering to that patient. And God had called me to minister to that patient. And she was a believer in Christ. And he really got antagonistic about it. And so finally in praying and seeking, the Lord said, why don't you help him to understand how much I love him? I said, Lord, I'd really like to tell him off. <laughs> he said, no, that's not the response I want. I want you to focus on me and allow that. Would you know the Jewish high holy days were coming? October, New Year, Yom Kippur, the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and, the, and it's coming now. And the Lord said to me, ask him if I might join him at the table. What? Join him at the table? You see, he was a devout Jewish believer, and each year he would have a Seder in his home. They would have the, 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 the what we call the Passover meal, communion, what we would call it, celebration. And he would brag about that, and he would talk about that. And see, the scripture says that, that every good Jewish believer would invite foreigners, aliens, Gentiles, <laughs> to come to the house of the Lord and come and celebrate to see what God has done for his people. It's there. Read it in Isaiah. Wow. So I asked him. As we were in the work together, I said, I, I want to wish you a happy new year in the Lord, that the Lord would bless you. I said, hey, I know a Seder's coming up. I'm an alien and I'm a foreigner. Would you invite me to your table? And he looked at me, and it was obvious in that moment that the Lord had already been preparing his heart, because it was the truth of the word. And he muttered and walked off. <laughs> Three days later, I got an email. He said, can you come to my house? We start at seven. So I went, my wife, I brought my children, I brought my family. And I said, hey, thank you for inviting me. And I began to point to him. I said, the God you serve, I'm sorry, we serve, is a great God. And as I sat at the Passover meal and we had it to the he at the head table as a good Jewish dad and celebrating having a Gentile in the house but yet celebrating the God you see focus on Christ and when you do you know after that meal we were like this we began to share the scripture we began to talk I began in the Old Testament I said hey guess what I'm teaching a Sunday school class and we're in Jeremiah. Ever heard of him? Oh. You see, focusing on Christ and letting him open the door to gentleness and humility, not returning insult for that, opens a door that begins then that God can work in a heart. God can then 
bring salvation, can bring restoration. See, I would have told him to get lost, go pound sand. I don't need this. I'm suffering here. Thanks, God. God, get him. God, fix him. But instead, God said, hey, how about, let me, if you'll be humble, if you'll let me walk in your life, if you'll lay down your rights, Jeff, what you think you need, what you think you deserve, and let me walk in through you, I can do great things. See the power of that? Do you hear what God wants to do in the life that's surrendered? And instead, so when we're persecuted, when we are called out, when we are for your faith, you believe that stuff? Yeah. Because the transformation in my life, allowing the Spirit to work through and take it, what a difference. What a closeness. What purpose and meaning when I go to work. When I'm out, I see God. So that when the persecution comes, is it painful? Yes. Do you like persecution? No. Are you looking to get it? Never. But the reality of the matter is that when we, and it comes, we should focus on Christ rather than our fears. Can I remind you in Luke, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing of the body, has the power to throw you into hell. Wow. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So when you're persecuted, when you are, the, when you are under your faith, and I don't know what to say, the scripture says you will be given what to say at that moment when you were called before. And oftentimes it may be to say nothing. However, we are be always to be ready to give an answer. Ahead of time, I challenge you, decide that you will not suffer silently. Can I say that again? Ahead of time, I want you to decide right now, I am not going to suffer silently for my faith. What are you saying, Pastor? Get up in their face? Are you saying that we should, you know, tell them where to go? No, 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 I'm not telling no, that's not it. Is it just, well, you know, watch my life and I'll go over here and pray. I'm being persecuted here. And we withdraw, we run, we hide. Is this not the day where the culture, in the culture we need to stand and be bright and let the love of God shine through? Saying, wow. You see, we need to decide we'll not suffer silently. That we, can you tell somebody why you have the hope that you have? Can you tell somebody why you can face tomorrow? Can you tell someone why, you know what, I'm out of work right now, but this is not the end of the rope because God has my back. My marriage isn't great right now, but you know, I'm seeking God and we're going to seek together and God's going to step in. I don't know where my daughter is right now, but you know what? I believe that God is going to step in. I have a hope in Christ Jesus. That's what we want to be ready to give an answer. You say, well, I don't see the money coming in because you know that when you say this, there are the critics, the analysts and everybody else lined up to say, well, I don't see it. You prayed, nothing happened. You're still sick. You're still out of work. You still have too many bills. God hasn't done it for you. What do you got? See, it's good to think through the hope that we have. You see, we, we know that we do not have to worry about those things because God says, my eye is on you. I will provide. Do you trust Him enough? See, we're more concerned about men and what men will say and what they can do to us than what God and how God can deliver us. Mm -hmm. We really are. We're more concerned about what men say about your faith and what you do, what you believe, and what you think, and what you think about God and how you live your life. We're more concerned about that, even in our own families, than to the extent of what, how God can deliver us and how He will step in. And how he will intervene. So always be ready to give an answer. But with gentleness. And with kindness. The other thing that and when we're challenged. 
we need to reply with gentleness. It's not telling off your tormentors. Don't tell off your tormentors. We'd like to. Yeah, it can be. Don't do it. You might need to walk away in the moment, but when you come back, hey, you know, when you said that, that really affected me. But I want to tell you something. It hasn't shaken my faith in Jesus. Because he's there. And he's delivered me and he will deliver me. And when you do that, it shows to them that, you know what, you are resolute in your faith and in what you believe. And the last thing is that keeping a clear conscience. Keeping a clear conscience. See, when you're accused, when you're under pressure, when you are tempted to compromise and justify yourself for your faith. You can't do it. You know why? It's not an option for believers. We can't justify ourselves because who's our justification? He is. We have no job. We can't justify it because He justified us. It's Him in us that justifies our faith and our walk, and our witness. It's Him. And so Christ is it. We must act righteously and speak with gentleness. And even if it comes in the face of evil, and down through the generations, even to this day around the world, there are men and women believers that are standing, speaking in the face of evil. Standing up. Trusting God. And you know that there have been great revivals that have broken out because of that. There has been great times of there are men and women, teenagers, boys and girls watching that when you take that stand in humbleness, humility, and gentleness, when you're pushed for your faith in a culture that says, stop it, go home and do that. Don't do that. That's your faith, not my faith. You have no right to say that. But instead, being humble and humble, there are others watching saying, I see Christ. I see Christ, and it calls them. It calls them to come, trusting Him. Peter reminds us that the reason we're able to stand up under persecution and suffering is in the last part. And it's because of what Christ did. Because He overcame sin and scorn and shame of the cross. He is the one who became our righteousness and justification. See, we can suffer well because He suffered well. We can stand up in a culture that says, be quiet. Don't say that. You're a bigot. I don't believe that. You have no right to say that. Stop saying that. Don't pray. Separate the church and state. Go away. But yet we can stand and say, but God is the answer. God is the truth we need. And boy, I don't know about you, but our country needs it. Our homes need it. But can we get all the way back to the source? You need it. It starts there. So as we pray, as we, as we look to it, say, I'm suffering. Count it all joy. You're worthy. That kind of leads to the inverse question. If I'm not suffering, Maybe there's really no difference between me and the world. Maybe they count me as one of them. Maybe they see no difference. That's between right now if the Holy Spirit in you is speaking. And again, it's not, I hope you heard this morning, it's not this brash. Get saved. You're going to hell. Well, that may be true. According to Scripture, if you don't know and have not had your sins forgiven. But you know, when the humility of Christ and when the love of Christ transforms a heart and the Spirit is allowed to work within us, it is then that what comes out in righteousness and mercy and peace and joy and the fruits of the Spirit and the world sees that and says, where did you get that? How do you I don't understand. It's a lost world looking for the light. So when suffering comes, 
It's an opportunity. When suffering comes, not something to run from. When it's suffering, God, get me out of here. Not that they don't pray that. I love this. The Apostle Paul, every town he went to, he didn't check Airbnb, TripAdvisor. He didn't have the app. He didn't, couldn't find a hotel. In fact, the Apostle Paul never looked for the best hotel. He always went to the jail and said, what kind of jail do you got? Because that's where I'm going. True. And yet he turned the world upside down because he was yielded. It wasn't his rights. It was Christ. And through the suffering, he said, oh, that it would be filled up in my life that I might know the all-surpassing power of Christ. Whew. Are you there? Do you know that? Do you want to know that? He said, Pastor, oh, that sounds so good, but I'm so far away. I have good news for you this morning. It takes just the yielding of your heart to say, God, be my God. Forgive me. I have avoided pain and suffering. And Lord, yeah, I have some aches and pains. We're not talking about the body. These bodies are all headed for one place. You and I know that. But I'm talking in my life and in my spiritual journey. I want to know the power of Christ in my life. And I want Him to work through it to reach a world that's lost. That comes by yielding your life to Him. Saying, Lord, forgive me. Be Lord of my life. Not my way, your way. And that would you be the humility in my life? Would you be the grace in my life for those people right now that are persecuting me? And they are there. We all have them. If not... They'll be there shortly. That you can stand and suffer well. And in the process, show them Christ. And I can tell you, I've seen many turn and come and follow Christ. Beautiful picture. As we close this morning, we're going to gather at the table right where you're at. And seating there, you should have found the elements that are there. If not, there should be one beside you. But what a beautiful picture of what it means in humility and humbleness. And as I shared with you with my friend, my physician friend, we we're still good friends. And boy, I tell you, I, I got to believe that he, he, he's coming to know Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. It's a powerful thing. But we gathered at the table. And in that gathering as the Passover meal that we celebrated in his home, Christ was present. Christ showed up. And when Christ shows up, everything changes. Amen. And so we want to gather at the table this morning, giving you the elements, and we want to partake together. And you remember that when Jesus gathered the disciples together, and when he gathered them, and he was referring to them, they all knew exactly what he was talking about in the Passover meal, because it was the Passover meal that they were celebrating. And as he did, he then put the fulfillment of it all together. And you can imagine the aha moment, right? Sitting at the table, this cup, that's the new covenant. That's my blood that I'm about to shed for you, for the remission of sin. And they're like, oh, yes. I remember that now. The blood that was over the doorpost, that death would pass over, that we'd pass from death to life, and it all began to click with him. And so as we come to the table this morning, suffering was a part of all of that. The suffering servant of God is Christ Jesus. He suffered well. He didn't repay insult for insult when they accused him who had no sin. And yet, he was silent. He didn't return. I could call 10,000 angels right now and, and clear the place, and there'd be a scorch mark right there. And yet, no. Because he realized in submitting to God, it's God's will, God would be honored. God would be glorified. So if you have your elements, I know sometimes if you haven't used these, there is on the top is the wafer, you need to peel that off. You can take that and then peel for the cup. 
We've prayed over these. Some of you may be the first time, but that's okay. We want to gather at the table this morning together. So on the night that they gathered, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Take and eat. And then, as I said, he took the cup. And there are actually many cups in the Passover meal that they celebrate together. Beautiful picture of a Passover meal. If you ever get the chance to share one with a, a Jewish and cut family as they saw do it I encourage the Seder meal beautiful picture he took the cup he said this is the new covenant the old covenant was eye for an eye tooth for a tooth death you sin you die that's it you break the law we take you out we stone that's it end of story the new covenant is grace oh there's still judgment there's still an accounting but you see, God's grace has fulfilled and covered the sin of all of humanity once and for all. And so he said, take and drink. And then he prayed, Father, we are so thankful that you suffered to the cross for us. Lord, we're honest. We don't like suffering. We don't even like getting the cold. I don't like getting a hangnail. Suffer, but yet, Lord, the beauty that in your suffering, that in your faithfulness, that in your obedience to the Father, you gave us mercy, forgiveness, purpose, and meaning. You took away our shame and our sin. You've transformed us. And now by your Spirit, because of the resurrection, Lord, you have conformed us and our conformities. So Lord, may we, as your people, always be prepared to share the hope, this hope in Christ Jesus, with love, with humility, with patience, <coughs> returning good for evil. Lord, your scripture says that when we do, boy, that places uh, burning coals on them. Hmm. That's pretty strong. But Lord, we want to say thank you that you are able, not our way, not our will, not our rights, but you, Lord, that the world may see your will more in us than our will. Lord, we thank you for these things. Challenge us this week for those that would persecute, criticize, Lord, that we would love. And may it start in the house of the Lord. For the world needs to see that God's people love one another. Compassionate, humility, and love for all things. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. As we go this morning, we want to close with a song. So if the worship team will come, and we want to sing our way out. How's that? Always good. And I encourage you... And I'll just say a brief benediction is to fellowship a bit outside of one another. It's still nice.
cause your face to shine upon them, Lord. May they know your presence. May they know that you are going before them, that you are providing resource and rest in the future. Lord, may you stand beside them and guide them, comfort them, lift them up in the day that they know. And Lord, may you be their rear guard, protecting them from unforeseen things that they don't know, Lord. May you just travel behind and may your angel protect them in all that you do. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And as you go, our ushers will dismiss from the rear and enjoy this week. See you next Saturday.